Anyway, so Matthew's Gospel, <coughs> chapter 13 and verse 24, and we're continuing in a series of the parables of Jesus. And this one is the parable of the weeds. Verse 24, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds up, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. So Lord, we did just pray for your word that you'll just uh, uh, bless it to us. Now, this is, this is, uh, this is part one of, of two. Now, what I mean by that is, is that that's the first uh, passage where Jesus talks about, about the weeds. But if you go further down the chapter, you'll see how Jesus explains all of it um, a little bit later on. We're not going to look at it this week, you know, but, uh, but that will come out through here. But many, uh, many, many, many years ago, when I was a little boy, my uh, granddad had, had a huge garden. It was massive. And I used to enjoy playing in it, doing all kinds of things. And he used to grow so much uh, a fresh, fi- a fresh food. One of the things he used to grow was peas in the pod. Now, we don't often see them these days, but they're, they're, they're like these green pods and you could run your thumb down and you get these little um, sweet peas. That used to be fantastic. And there was always all kinds of fruits on the trees and all that sort of stuff. And of course, there's things like firing, firing frogs from catapults, that kind of thing. You know, the normal kind of stuff that kids do. Absolutely fantastic. I used, to, I used to love digging in the garden, and I used to enjoy the bonfires that we used to have as we used to burn all the rubbish. But, but it was always under my granddad's supervision. And the one time that I did things my own way was, guess what? It was a disaster. I came out in the back garden one day in Beckles and I saw all these rows of little, uh, little green shoots, like guardsmen on parade. They were, they were spaced out and all the rest of it, which should have been a clue to me. And I thought that they were weeds, but they weren't. They were potato shoots pushing through. Anyway, so guess what I did? Thinking that I was going to be helping my granddad and I'd, I'd get an extra sweet later on that day for being a good lad, I pulled them all up. I pulled them up and I put them in my hands and I put them in a bucket and the rest of it. And then when Grandad came outside, I said, Grandad, look what I've done. I said, I've, I pulled out some of these weeds from the garden. And he said, show me where you put them from, boy. So we walked up the garden there and I had this sense of impending doom that maybe, just, just maybe I've done something wrong. And we got to the potato patch, rows and rows. And Grandad looked at them. And there was like this long, long, long silence where he just slowly shook his head. He looked at me, he said, Gary, he said, that's the potatoes gone. I said, potatoes, I thought they were weeds. He said, no. Next time you want to do anything, speak to me, please. And he was so, up, he was so angry with me, although he didn't show to me nothing like that, he actually took my catapult away, which was, which was the biggest thing which anybody could do to me because I... I was quite naughty with my catapult. Anyway, back to uh, back to scriptures. From this passage today, we can we can see straight away that there are two really quite important lessons which we can learn from this. And the first thing, because it's talking about wheat and weeds, false and truth, and we must know God's word very well, so that error when we hear an error about something regardless of how, pres- of how convincingly it's, it's, presented, it's presented to us, it doesn't mislead us. We, know, we need to know our wheat from our weeds. Truth over lies. And Paul, St Paul, warned the leaders of the church in, in Ephesus, in, in Acts chapter 20, he said this, Even from your own number, men will arise 
and distort the truth in order to draw many disciples after them. So be on your guard. This is what Paul said to the early church. Be careful because there's always going to be weeds among the wheat. There's always going to be um, liars who come into the truthfulness of, of church. So that's the first thing. We need to know the truth. We need to know error from truth. And the second thing is, is that we must need to stay spiritually awake and alert. Notice that the wheat... And notice that the seeds were sown that night didn't produce a harvest of weeds until much later. They, nobody noticed. And at that point, they could not be uprooted. And perhaps you think this is no big deal. You know, surely you should be able to go out there and pull out the weeds from that. Well, when it comes to error, when it comes to problems, one degree of course may seem harmless to harmless enough if you're in a boat and you're and let's suppose that you've got to um go on um 280 degrees but let's suppose that for some reason you're a bit you're a bit slow you're a little bit lax and you steer on 281 degrees for example after a thousand miles you will be almost 12 miles off course 2000 miles will be about 24 25 miles off course think about that if you want to get where you're going, you have to know where you're going. You have to know the truth of where you're going. Spiritually speaking, you will end up far from God if you don't keep to the trajectory that God has given you. So what's the answer? Well, it's quite simple. It's keep in God's word. Jesus goes on to explain later on in this entire chapter that he himself is the farmer in this story. His workers are heaven's angels and the enemy that infiltrates the field is the evil one or the devil. But it's the weeds that I kind of want to focus on, on today. Um, it's quite interesting to do that because the wheat represents believers, Christians, who have been born again into God's kingdom. But the weeds represent everyone else. Anyone who hasn't yet, and I repeat yet, been born into God's great kingdom. And like the weeds in the parable, unsaved souls tend to share certain characteristics. So I'd like to hi highlight just three features of the weeds in this parable. And it's quite important to do that because Jesus thought that was important as well. The first thing is that weeds can be deceptive because they can be easily confused for wheat. And it's hard to tell the difference. In fact, most um, scholars um, tend to believe that when Jesus was preaching here, that he was describing a specific type of weed known as bearded darnel. Excuse me, just take a drink of water. It, it was a type of weird, beard, weird, weed. Gosh, I'll get there eventually. It was a type of weed known as bearded darnel. Now, this bearded darnel typically flourishes in the same fields as wheat and the similarity between these two plants is so great that in some regions Darnell is referred to as false wheat because the wheat and the weeds are almost indistinguishable until the air until the ear of the corn appears and I did have some pictures um, earlier on but, um, but they weren't of high enough quality to put up on there. But they look so similar that you can't tell the wheat from the weeds in some cases unless you're a real expert. And later Jesus explains to his, his disciples that the field is the world and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom and the weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. So, so the similarity between the wheat and the weeds, however, is a real reminder that we can't always tell the difference. The world is filled with believers and unbelievers, people who are saved and people who are lost. But you and I aren't always in a position to tell which is which. That's why we have to be kind, that's why we have to be gentle to everyone. A few chapters earlier in Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this, he said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, <coughs> we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, and this is Jesus speaking, but I will reply, I never knew you. Wow, isn't that a challenge? 
yeah, when we look around today. So the first thing is, is that weeds can be very deceiving because they're almost the same as that. And the second thing is that they can be damaging. And in the parable, when the workers asked, asked the farmer if they should pull up the weeds, he replied, no, lest in the gathering, in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both <coughs> grow together until the harvest. <coughs> Excuse me. The farmer didn't want his, his workers pulling up the weeds because they looked too similar to the wheat and he didn't want any of the wheat to be damaged in the process. And that's important. It may also be that the, that the roots from the weeds had entangled themselves in, in the wheat roots and so even if you pulled up the right plants, if you could recognise which were the Darnell plants, then the wheat could still be really damaged as well. And of course, we don't, we don't need the parable to tell us that weeds are bad. If you tend the garden, your, your first instinct upon seeing the weed is probably the same as the workers in the parable. You want to pull them out. Weeds have very invasive root systems which grow underneath that quickly take over all of the surrounding earth, stealing, the, stealing all the nutrients and the water to the other plants. Now in our back garden we have some bamboo, we have some big, uh, great big uh, uh, bamboo plants and they have grown underneath the concrete and they're coming up, aren't they boys, Und underneath, the, um, underneath the swing. So they've travelled about seven or eight feet underneath and they're pushing through, they're pushing through safety mat, really quite sharp as well. Now the same thing can happen to us in our spiritual lives if we are surrounded with weedy people okay the apostle paul puts uh, puts it this way in 1 corinthians 15 he says do not be deceived bad company corrupts good morals it's like mum used to tell us one rotten apple can uh, can spoil the whole bunch the principle holds true for our spiritual lives as well because the world as we know is filled with both believers and unbelievers, Christians and non-Christians. We live next door to each other, we work in the same offices. Um, if you go to the gym, no, there'll be other people there the same. And in some cases we might even live under the same roof as people as And sometimes we live under the same roof with people who don't share the same faith as us. So as Christians, we need to exercise discernment in those relationships and keep close to God's word. That's why we must know God's word quite well. And, and I've found this in work many, many, many times when, you know, when, when you've been going through different situations that sometimes people will try and lead you astray. They'll try to entangle you with their own viewpoints and just kind of drag you down. This is an interesting fact which I found this week, this week. Several, well many, many years ago, around the turn of the, of the 19th century, some musicians noticed that all the errand boys in, in a certain part of London all whistled out of tune. They even sang out of tune as they rode around on the bicycles making deliveries. They used to have barrow boys going around on, on bicycles and pushing things around. And of course they used to whistle and, and sing themselves. But they found that they were always out of tune, just in this particular part of London. After a while, these musicians discovered the reason for their poor pitch was that the bells of Westminster were slightly out of tune. And the Erin boys had unconsciously copied their pitch. Isn't that interesting? That's something like that. Now, I didn't know that bells could be tuned as well. That, that, was, a, you know, that, was, a, that was a revelation to me with the campanology. But last night, uh, me and Jane, we watched a film called uh, Military Wives, uh, didn't we? And there was a, there's a particular scene there, and it's a great film to watch. It's about, it's about this group of um, soldiers' wives who formed a choir while their, uh, while their uh, men were out in Afghanistan. And um, there's this one scene where they go out to... It was their first public performance, they were going to sing in this marketplace, and up until that point they've been singing in like a hall you know, where that was nice, uh, that was nice and um, quiet. And of course, if you've been in the choir, uh, somebody will uh, press a note and la, 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 this is the key we're going to follow. And of course, when they were standing outside in this marketplace, there was a lorry reverse and you know, one of those uh, satirical things going beep, beep, 
beep, beep, beep. So just as they were about to sing, that was the song that they heard. And so they all sang dreadfully out of tune, didn't they, Jane? It was, it was really quite horrible. But that's what, can, oh, that's what can happen to us sometimes if things are slightly out of tune in our life. We can make the wrong sound. That's why we need to have the pitch of, of Jesus in our lives. Now, in the same way, we, it's possible to think and act like the people that we surround ourselves with. And if we spend time with negative, unbelieving, or even really immoral people, even those who call themselves Christians, then it's possible that your faith and your spiritual life will will be damaged if you are not strong in the Lord. If you don't keep in his word, if you just don't keep listening to his word, if you don't keep reading his word, that is very easy to be pulled away. So the third thing, and we're nearly finished, is, is the last thing that the, uh, the weeds do is, is destroyed. And the parable ends with the weeds being bundled and burned while the wheat is carried um, gleefully into the farmer's barn. It's a happy ending unless you happen to be a weed. And Jesus explained this part of the parable, saying, As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. This this voice kind of tells us about an incredibly sober spiritual reality. And that's hell. It's, It's a topic which people don't like to talk about. And no topic I are found as a pastor stirs greater resistance. Now, according to, according to some recent polls, 81% of adults believe in heaven. And 80% expect to go there when they die, whether they have faith or not. Right? Let me just say that unless you know Jesus as your Lord and your Saviour and you've repented of that sin, then you won't be going to heaven. It, you, do, you don't get there by being good, you don't get there by being in a Christian country, you don't get there by having a Christian mum or dad or a Christian grand, grandmother. The only way that you get to heaven is if you declare that Jesus is Lord, that you're a sinner, that you repent, you turn from that sin, and you say, Jesus, come into my life, and you follow him. So I found that amazing reading that, that there are 80% of people who believe that they're going to go there whether or not they have faith or not. And of course, what happens in some, in some sections of the church is that they have propagated this lie. They really have. And of course, now you, see, you see lots of stuff in the media as well. Now, by comparison, 61% of people believe in hell. But less, and listen to this, right, this is amazing. I had to check this a couple of times. 61% of people believe in hell, but less than 1% think it's likely that they will go there. In other words, a slight majority of people still believe hell exists, but they don't take it seriously. Why? Well, one of the reasons is because the media and Hollywood have this strange idea that all you need to, uh, to, uh, uh, all you need to enter eternal life, heaven, is that you are a good person. And it's wrong. How many times do we see, you know, when somebody dies and on being sympathetic to this. That when people die, it's, oh, they could be in heaven now, the angels are with them. And, and I've known that said about a number of people um, over, over many years who were complete scoundrels. They had no faith, they had nothing. And yet, I sat in a crematorium once with his vicar, said, oh yes, they'll be standing at the right hand of Jesus, now they'll be doing this. And I think to myself, this man was, you know, he had no faith. And I think to myself, you preached a wrong gospel. And many of the people who sat there that day believed that all you needed to get into heaven was to be nice and kind and make a few charitable, uh, charitable donations. And sometimes, it, now you may think it's cruel just to, you know, just to talk like this, but let me just say that the reality of hell is awfulness. It's, it's, it's a place, right, keep still. It's, 
It's a place where you will be conscious. It's a place where you will know what's gone in the past, and the Bible talks about that. And just imagine that, just imagine being the place where it's like, I really had no reason to be here. This is, this is my choice, because everybody makes a choice for Jesus or against Jesus. And that's what it comes down to at the end. It's heaven or hell. It's eternity with God or eternity separated round. Now that may sound very tough, but this is what God's words teach us. And therefore, as a pastor, I would be completely failing you and failing everybody who watches this as well and, and so on if I just said, oh yeah, it's fine. Just fine. Just live your life. Just, just be nice to people. Put something in the Salvation Army um, box. Um, buy somebody a packet of crisps if they're hungry and you're going to go to heaven. No. It's repentance. It's turning from sin. It's accepting that Jesus is Lord and Saviour. And then, and then this, uh, this covenant, this promise with him to follow him for the rest of your life. Even the most famous verse in the Bible, or at least I think it is, contains a one-word picture of hell. Listen to this. John's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 16, it says this. Jesus said, so I love the way it starts off. Jesus said, it wasn't anybody else, it was Jesus. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And there's that word, perish. Wow. You see, because in hell, everything perishes. Hope perishes, happiness perishes, even the bodies and souls of of people there will perish. Like weeds in that fiery furnace, hell consumes everything that enters it. In the the agricultural world, you know, another another thing's everything to do with like flowers and plants and, and, and farming. Weeds have never, ever been known to transform into wheat. It's never been known. That sort of magical transformation is completely unheard of. So when you've got the weeds, that's when you've got the wheat and the weeds together, there's, there really is no hope in just thinking that the weeds are suddenly going to change. But in the spiritual world, in real life, it happens every day. Because the Bible says that God doesn't want anyone to be destroyed but for everyone to come to repentance. In other words, God longs for every weed to become wheat. And he's talking at that point about Christians and non-Christians. God longs for every person who does not know Jesus as Lord to come to know (coughs) Jesus as Lord and become a follower of him. Not so we can have bums on seats, not so we can just have, I don't know, whatever. But it's, it's this whole thing about salvation. And, and that's wonderful. So just as we finish, again, Jesus said uh, very clearly in this uh, John's Gospel, chapter 16, in verse 17, this is what it says. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You see, that's the big difference. You see, I get really fed up with Christians, and, and I'm quite vocal about this on social media and uh, I'm speaking, people who point the fingers and saying, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. Do you know what? That's, sometimes that can lead people to condemnation. But actually, what Jesus did was that he brought conviction. And that's a big difference. Not condemnation, but conviction. Every time Jesus spoke to people, or the vast majority of people, or the vast majority of times that pe- uh, Jesus spoke to people, they ended up realising that they were sinners. Why? Because there was a presence of God which made them feel uncomfortable. That they suddenly realised, wow, maybe I should be following God. Maybe I, maybe I do need to have a change of life. And this is where we need to be. But to save the world through him, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's as clear as you can get. You can't make it any more clear. It's like having a rock and chiselling everything in there which can't be changed. God's word says it very, very simply that if you want to follow Jesus, you have to turn from sin. So the challenge for us all in many ways, isn't it? What do we want to be? Do we want to be wheat? Do we want to be weeds? Do we want to be 
followers of Jesus or do we want to just carry on with our lives and, and heading towards a Christless eternity? Well, we're just gonna we're just gonna pray now, and then um, I think if if I can work this, we might have a we might have a final song if I can get this working. This is turned off, so let's so let's just pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that you give us a choice. Lord, we can be wheat or weeds in our life. We can be followers of you, or we can just turn away from you. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, for every one of us, Lord, that you help us to get into your word. Lord, you'd help us to grow in your word. Lord, help us to understand your word. Lord, help us to know the difference between error and truth. Because Jesus, you say in your words that you are the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through you. Amen. Amen. So, hopefully... Where has this gone to? Yeah. So we're going to finish with a song, Hallelujah, Your Love is Amazing. Hopefully. Nope. Oh, there we go.